Lord saying this body is weak and the spirit's not willing. He says the religious spirit has came into the church. It's choking the church. He says many people are seeking their own futures, but they're not seeking what the Lord's telling them to do. This is his time. The Lord says this is time for my body. Where the flesh is strong, the spirit is strong, and the soul is strong. He says that the many soul winners are in the world right now, but if they're not Christian. He says these are people winning the souls for the secular, for Islam. He says there is a breakthrough. There is a shifting in the, in the heavenlies. The Lord says there is a window, but the time is short. In Yeshua's name, amen. I really can't see with that, those lights up there. We, uh, we're dealing with a whole bunch of different issues. Uh, we were in worship and the Lord is showing me, we, we've been dealing with several d different Jezebel spirits, okay? And, you know, these are manifesting men, manifesting women. But the, it, it's almost, it's amazing how what we've been dealing with in the last three or four weeks is directly targeting men of God. I am just talking, it is like a heat-seeking missile going after the body. And, and the, the men I've been dealing with, they're just taking direct hits. And so we pray over the ministries, the many pastors we know, that the Lord just reveals to them how to get out of it. And when we were in worship, the Lord was showing me almost like people are stuck in quicksand. You know, you ever see, the, you know... You know, somebody's stuck in the, in the movies, they're stuck in quicksand, and they're right in the middle, and there's nothing to grab. But the Lord is showing me His Spirit in those people can rise up and break free. Amen. Because what happens when people get in quicksand, they lose hope. And that's kind of that's where we're at right now. We're, we're, de we're dealing a lot of battles. We're seeing stuff in the newspaper. I'm hearing stuff concerning uh, this Ebola where there are cases showing up and the people are actually disappearing. They're disappearing. It's like, you know, what happened to that guy? So, you know, I, I, don't, I don't trust the media. I, I just, we just start calling what it is. It's a medium. You know, it is. It is because it's, it's filtering into people, into their homes, a false spirit. And so this is a time, that, uh, as Pastor Kimley was saying, we're, we're, we're tuning in to this end time understanding how to survive. And I believe the first thing is going to go back to prayer. It's going to be not the body of Christ. Uh, Lester Summerall, years ago, how many people know who Lester Summerall is? Years ago, he was, he was speaking about the body of Christ and described it as a giant Seriously, a giant. But it's a sick giant. And individually, you might have a part or something working and operating. You know, it's a body of Christ. But overall, it's sick. And see, the, when, when Adam sinned, his body got sick, went to death. And so the body of Christ is not emulating, is not copying what Christ gave us, which is a healthy body. And it goes back to what is a healthy body? It's a righteous body. Not a self-righteous, but a, a body in right standing. A body that has the understanding of what the Word of God is and how to function it. Okay, and we're going to get into it. And over the next few weeks, we're going to get into some teaching concerning confession, covenant, and proclamation. Okay, it's amazing, you know, being married. How many people have ever been married? Every once in a while, Kimberly wakes up and has this brilliant moment where she realizes there's a benefit to being married to me. <laughs> you know, and, and sometimes it's amazing because she can't say my last name. So <laughs> we, we were at the Toyota dealer one time and they're calling Kimberly Ritter, Kimberly Ritter over the intercom. And she's just, she didn't recognize it was her. So when she, she wants something 
she, if she doesn't want to give her real name, her legal name, which is Kimberly Cho, she'll use Kimberly Ritter, and she'll throw that out there. And, and it's just kind of, you know, this is like, you know, kind of, <laughs> but, but that's kind of, that's kind of, that's kind of the way that we treat the body of Christ. The body of Christ is rejecting the spirit of God, the covering that God has given us. And so we're, we're in the book of uh, uh, Genesis right now, and, and we start with Bereshit, uh, and in this we, we start seeing God's beginning of his redemption plan. And, uh, and we're in the uh, chapter 9, verse 16, and we, 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 dozens of people have talked about Noah. I saw something on Facebook about Noah. They found the, the ark and everything. And then the, that movie that came out that was wrong. Um, uh, in verse 16, chapter, uh, Genesis 9, verse 16. Now the bow is in the cloud. Then I will look up, look upon it to remember the every every lasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. Verse verse seventeen. And God said to Noah, "This is a sign of covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is on the earth." You know, we we, we went through the two blood moons, the last month. Okay, or we went through one last month and went one uh, back in Passover. Yesterday was a partial eclipse. How many people saw that? You couldn't look at it. You'd go blind. But you, you can do it on the Facebook and everything. And some people said, well, it looked like a Pac-Man. or Actually, it looked like the symbol that Islam uses to war. Looks look just like that symbol. And see, when they go to war... They don't have just the, the happy crescent moon this way. They have it upside down. And then they put the star, star here. And that goes back to Babylon. It goes back to a lot of different spirits. But we've been battled this whole week. We've been battling some religious spirits. Uh, we've seen this happen where there's been a couple attacks up in Canada. There was one in New, in New York. And, and, and we're being deceived when they say this man from Morocco, man from Morocco, just, can't, just became a con convert. To Islam. That's a deception. You go to Morocco, it's 98% is Muslim. This guy just converted to radical Islam. Okay, but see, the, the, the body of Christ, we're, we're stuck in that quicksand state where we can't shift out. We start looking at what, what uh, God promised Noah about the everlasting covenant. We have to start understanding... What is your covenant with God? He made a covenant of flesh. Basically, he said, I will not flood again. And when we get into Nimrod, we see Nimrod building the towers of Babel. The purpose of the, he built the towers, if you start getting into some of the Hebrew com uh, commentary, he built the towers because he thought God was going to flood the place again. Well, that makes sense. And so what did God do? He just stepped on it. He smashed them down like a Coke can. He smashed them flat into the ground. <laughs> he did. He just got rid of them. He said, I can do it this way too. So the covenant is something that God showed from the beginning. He had one with Adam. He had one with Noah. And he has one with Abraham. There's three covenants that we function on, under. And when people use the term, the new covenant, the newest covenant is Abraham's covenant, which is reciprocated, brought to fruition by Christ at the cross. That has to happen. We start taking this up to the next level. The question for the, the week is, what is the sign of your covenant with God? When somebody looks at you, how do they know that you have a covenant with God? Now, we can talk about the rainbow all day, and all the people in the one church, the, the, they have the rainbow church. How many people know what I'm talking about? How many people know what I'm talking about? <laughs> the rainbow church. Yeah. They, that's their covenant. That's their symbol. Yeah. And it's amazing how man can take something that's 100% God, reprogram it, stick his name on it, defile it, 
and call it his. And this is what's going on with the church right now and the body of Christ is completely out of whack. So when something does come against you, comes against the church, you don't understand your covenant. You don't know how to step, you how to walk, how to stay out of trouble. This is what the teaching we're going to be focusing on in the next few weeks. So first of all, we're going to say, what is your covenant? What is your covenant? Is it, is it, is it a form of religion? Is it understanding who the creator is and the, how he sacrificed his son? Is, is it just something you're doing religiously? I'm a good person. Where's that covenant? What is your one-on-one -on -one with God? Your one-on-one -on -one with God. What is it in your life? And we come across a lot of philosophy that is just self-serving philosophy and there's no blood in it. And I'm telling you, it needs to have blood, sweat, and tears in it. There has to be some work on your side because the body of Christ is anemic. And when we get attacked, it gets knocked down. And this is why we're having the meeting tomorrow. Because if we can get out of that anemic stage, build ourselves up spiritually, have the right attitude, have our bodies clean, when we do get attacked, the devil can't find a stronghold or a back door he can get in and damage you any further. We will always have the storms, but we have to take it to the next level, and we have to prepare the church. This is common sense understanding. So the religious spirit cannot survive in this at atmosphere. It's going to be a common sense spirit where you're going to confront things in yourself, and you have to get prepared. That's what we're going to be doing tomorrow night. We're going to be talking about this on, on, a, on, a, on a natural level, to prepare, but, it, but it's going to take a spiritual covering on your, your behalf too. Because there's some, th you, can do certain, you can do things naturally, but if your spirit's not tuned into God, when you get attacked, you're going to fall down because you start falling out of faith and into fear. Praise God. We, we're going to see that. We're going to see people shift into that fear mode. And it says it in the Bible, in the end times, people will literally die of fear. Seriously, they just go, they just, just, oh, they just die. Did you, anybody ever hear the story uh, about the, this guy had a fear. He worked at a meat locker. Has anybody ever heard this story? He had, he worked at a meat locker and he had a fear of getting locked into one of the meat closets because he, he, he would freeze to death. Anybody ever hear this story? Well, what happened was one day he's working by himself. There's nobody there and he got himself locked in a meat locker. Well, the next morning, they found him dead. He couldn't get out. The problem was, the meat locker wasn't working. He died in his mind of hyperthermia. He froze to death based on his mind. Has anybody ever heard this story? One person. All right, all right. Great story. But can you imagine, that's what's happening to people. They're dying of fear. And it's like, what's well, the end time? Of, well, uh, you know what? Whatever happens to you, and you have a covenant with God, you're going to make it. You're going to make it. You have Christ in you. So whatever resurrection power that you receive as you're born again, that spirit's in you to take you to the next place and level. Now, if you start depending on it at that level now, how much more successful your life will be? Everybody here is an evangelist. You have to realize that your life has to be that, that shining tower. People will be living in fear, 100% fear. Um, you don't know me. <laughs> Poor Kimberly, you know, somebody said, ask Kimberly to describe my son. No, he's just like me. And she said, what do you call him, a little bear? This kid is fearless. And I'm not just talking, hey, because he's, you know. But he goes out and he stalks things. And we got to be predators in the spirit going after demonic things that are attacking us. And if you're, you're you know, David was a herdsman. And he had to encourage himself. But he also remembered that he killed the lion, the tiger, and the bear. There you go. 
I got it. So what is your covenant? You just have a church relationship. You have a one on one relationship. You have a spiritual relationship. Or how about all three? How about getting born again, serving the body, and building the body? That's where you're going to get. There's a cycle in the body of Christ as well as you're born again, how to grow up, what to do, and how to reproduce. And I, I'm concerned about the body because that same process is how you grow your family. And the body of Christ is not growing families anymore. We're seeing a lot of broken families out there, and that's a reflection of the church, and the church is a reflection of society, it's because we have allowed the secular to come in and destroy us. We're going to we get into some uh, breakdown on covenant, confession, and proclamation. Now, a covenant is something that is agreed upon by God. It's two-party. And let me explain something. In the Hebrew mindset, if we have a covenant, it's not 50-50. It's 100-100. So, you know, uh, elder's my partner, right? So we're, we're working, we got this, hey, business thing, we're doing great. He gets knocked down, he can't work. I'm 100% obligated to hold his end up. Now, in our secular world, well, he fell out, you will make excuses, well, we don't need him or we're leaving behind. That's not how it is in Hebrew. What it is, when we sin, God had a covenant with Adam. And he had to come back and restore him to a certain point and maintain everything in his life. Well, what Adam did, he brought curses into the bloodline, into the family line, onto the planet. Everything from that point is in the process of being restored and will be restored. But the relationship and covenant is always there. So all the covenants we see in the Bible, when you accept Christ, there's a, it's a relationship. Now, let's say... Elder and I were partners, and he decided to let me do all the work. Well, I will benefit. But he won't benefit. And this is where we start getting unequally low. I, you're a workaholic, I know that. But this is where we have to have the mutual understanding how the church operates. And there's too many churches right now where people church hop. They just come in to get as much as they can from the church, and they leave. They're like spiritual vampires. They just go from place to place, draining the blood out of the people, and that's that. Can you turn the AC? So the covenant understanding is going to happen. Now, the number one covenant, uh, I'm going to put it this way, in the Hebrew is when you adopt somebody. When you adopt somebody, your son that you have naturally, and you adopt another child, your adopted child is actually worth more than your flesh and blood. Okay, Zoe, you're adopted. Oh man, hey, just got a promotion. <laughs> but that adoption process means that as the adopted father, I can never give you away. I can give my son away. God gave his only begotten son so we can become a son. That's a covenant. The next thing we start dealing with is confession. And the confessions, there's four kinds of confessions we see in the Bible. The first group of confessions has to do with God dealing with the pre-cross believers, Israel, the Hebrews. God had a way to deal in confession with these people. And so... Um, we see John the Baptist in the, in the New Testament dealing with the unbelievers by saying, repent, repent. So the, there, was, there was a classification of people that Jesus dealt with, John the Baptist dealt with before the cross, and that they had to repent in the flesh with their mouth to the point where they, would un they could see he was the Messiah. After the cross, there's a new kind of repentance. We've accepted Christ as Savior. And then we start seeing that um, 
after the, let's go to Romans 10, 9, and 10. The confession of the believer as we believe. Okay, well, you're talking about name it, play, name it claim it, blab it, grab it. Kind of. <laughs> Remember last week we were talking about in uh, the English language, we learn by the heart. Remember we talked about that? In Hebrew, they learn by confessing in their mouth. We see that in, in Joshua, that Joshua said, mutter it, meditate, repeat it, say it over and over. Let it come in, go out, come in, go out. So you, you're speaking it out of your mouth and your ears are hearing it into your own soul and your spirit, man. Romans 10, verses 9 and 10. It says, if you confess with your mouth, the, your Lord, uh, your mouth, Jesus says, Lord, and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. How many people confess this? This is a confession. This is just, this is just basic 101, get yourself saved. All right? For with the heart man believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. You cannot have salvation without confession. Now, I, there's a lot of people that will deny Christ and say they're saved. They will say, I believe in this, but I don't believe in that. And this is the deception of the religious spirit. There has, there's, a, there's, a, there's a progression here that God's giving us. It's, it's called... Um, excuse me. <laughs> progressive revelation. Okay? So that progressive revelation is as we're seeing something, it's developing before our eyes. So as we're confessing these things, so when we understand Psalm 91... When we start confessing Psalm 91, we're protected by that because our spirit man is built up. We know that there is a protection around us. We might take a few hits, but we're going to be okay in the long run because we know Job. The devil could not kill Job. Right? He took, he took everything and God restored him. So there, there's a confession of faith and salvation. And then uh, let's go to... Uh, the believer's confession, which after you, you've gotten saved, let's go to uh, uh, 1 John. Verse 9. 1 John, verse 9. Hold on, I get them. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and righteous to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. You get saved by confession. You get cleaned up by confession. Well, I, I, you, know, uh, you know, I got, I got a little issue with Colorado. We have one state votes against gay marriage and our courts overturn it. And then we got federal laws against drugs and one state votes for it and they, got, they can sell pot now. And so the kids are completely confused. Right. Well, it's legal. We got a whole generation of pharmacia, witchcraft. Right. This has to be broken. And so we need to stand on our, our, our feet and say these things out. And so when we start calling the devil who he is and it's demonic, and we're the righteous, and our country's based on righteousness, our country's based on the word of God, we're repeating what God wants his purpose to be. So there's a confession of the believer to get himself back on track. In verse, in Hebrews, let's go to Hebrews 10, 23. Once you got yourself saved, once you got yourself cleaned up for the second time, fifth time, a hundredth time, we want to go to Hebrews 10, 23. There's another, conf there's another confession that we deal with. It's the confession of hold fast, maintain. And in, in Hebrews 10, 23, 
Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promises is faithful, and let us consider how to stimulate one another to in love and good deeds. And it's kind of funny because the next verse on 25, it says, not forsaken the assemblage. We were dealing with a Jezebel spirit the other day, and the lady is like, well, God told me not to go to church 14 years ago. Then God said to the same lady, I need to correct pastors of churches. Wow. So you're not under any covering, and you can come in and, and try to tell me something. And so the conversation goes on. And she brings up a couple points to shark somebody else. We're subtle people. And I said, you're lucky you didn't do it to me. She, let me tell you what she did. She downed a pastor in her own home, in his house. Wow. Rebuked him. I said, well, you're lucky that didn't happen at my house because I would have kicked your butt out the door and Kimberly would have held it open. <laughs> and she replies with this little holy thing. It's like, hey, we don't, we don't, we're not going to have you come in and terrorize ministries like that. Because they come in like this angel of light. You know, oh, look at me, you know, I'm glowing. Yeah, that's the fire of hell on you, lady. So we need to hold fast our confession. We hold our faith account by the word. We build up the word of God in us. And then we also have to have faith and build up our trust in the Father. Then we swing around and we understand that our faith, our confession of who Christ is, the Messiah, Yeshua HaMashiach, the Messiah, and he is our Savior. And I believe this is where we're going to see issues in the end time where people who are believers submit to the devil. We got, there's a lady over in Pakistan right now, the, the woman who's a Christian, they're going to kill her because of her confession of faith. Well, it is blasphemy, and she's, and she's a Christian. She has five children. Have you been keeping up with this? Joseph's from Pakistan. This is This is crazy. Are you going to be challenged at that level? Are you going to be challenged at that level? Hey, when some nutcase comes out with an axe chasing after two police officers, first of all, he's not very smart. <laughs> you know, because they're going to go cowboy on him. But they have more faith in that demonic inspiration. I'm getting 72 virgins. I got the memo. <laughs> what is that? So we need to learn to hold fast to our faith. Well, you know, Christianity, we're supposed to be so nice to everybody. We have to, no, 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 that's Catholicism. That's the devil taking the power out of the church. That's that mindset that the devil's been lying to us for 1,700 years. No, we are Hebrews. We uh, posted on Facebook a couple weeks ago, we had a pastor visit our house, and we got these big old swords. <laughs> we got one on the wall, it's like this long, it's five feet. And he was like, wow, look at that sword. So I, I, got, I got another sword, and I said, well, my name is Carl. In Korean, it's sword, Carl. Carl. And so I, go, I went and got my sword out of my bedroom. Hey, I got a sword in my bedroom. <laughs> and it's four and a half feet long. And so he's trying to hold it like this, and I think uh, Pastor Tinas recognized this. Like, hey, this is a two-handed sword. Sometimes you got to use two hands to get the job done. You've got to use both hands. You've got to put some effort into it. And the church has been half-hearted dealing with the devil and not calling it what it is. So our confession, there's four kinds of confessions we see in the Bible. There's three that we function in. Has to do with our salvation. Has to do about our regeneration or our repentance after we're saved. And then maintaining our salvation, building ourselves up as a body. There are, those kind of confessions are necessary, and they're going to be here. We're going to go over this later. I know Dan was taking a lot of notes. We're going to build up your understanding of how to build yourself up. Bottom line. I like this kind of teaching. So we, the next thing, we have to understand our confession 
takes us into five areas. There's five areas, there's five f frames of mind in the New Testament to maintain our confession. There's five different areas we're going to break down. First of all, the first area is what God in Christ has brought to us, in us, through the death, burial, resurrection, and the seating of Christ. Jesus Christ died on the cross. He rose again. He gave us the Holy Spirit. He ascended to the, to the right hand of God. He's seated there, but he's still functioning. He's still functioning. There's things that he's doing that we can, I don't want to call it just claim. We need to follow, emulate, and receive this confession where we know who we are in Christ. We need to know who we are in Christ. So when the devil comes at us, hey, we're God's property. Je the Holy Spirit's inside us. I'm bought and paid. I'm not a part of the Adams family anymore. <laughs> we have to shift into that lane so when the devil comes, our insurance is paid up and we're not worried about a little ding. Right. We're not worried about that. Most of these accidents happen is because, you know, people get, uh, oh, I almost hit a squirrel. Hey, what is it? You're going to worry about a squirrel or your family? There's going to be choices we're going to have to make here, but if you can keep your confession, focus on the fact that Christ is in us, that you, and he's brought these things into us, and he's placed us into a higher place. Next, what has God placed in us through his word? God has given us his word, the spirit, and the new birth, and speaking in tongues. He's given us this so we're empowered. See, there, there's nothing more Jesus can do for you. He died on the cross. Now, you have his word, his spirit, you're his body, and you're supposed to breathe it, speak it out, do it, claim it, walk it, talk it. It has to happen. You're empowered. So if something's not happening in his life, it has to do with you not yielding. You have to yield to the spirit, to the spirit of the word, the word itself. Speak the word out your mouth so you can walk and talk as Christ did. You didn't see Christ. Oh, oh he has a thousand demons in him. Oh, I'm a legion. Oh, no. Where's the pigs? Where's the pigs? <laughs> you know, you put, you got to get them out. Next, the third area. What are we to God, the Father, in Christ? What are you, how do you imagine yourself or view yourself? What is your perception of what the Father is viewing you as. Christ is in you. You've been redeemed. And you become his child. Wow, that's a whole shifting. Because before, we were lost puppies. We didn't have any rights. We were part of a sin family to death. And all of a sudden, he put his spirit in you. You've accepted the covenant... He's put his spirit in you, his word. All of a sudden, you've been translated from darkness into light. This is, this is how it starts working. And all of a sudden, he sees you as his child. He sees you as Christ. I know there's a lot of flaky teaching out there, but you got to start, when he starts saying that he sees you as a son of God, you're part of that family. You're not part of the dead family anymore. You've shifted into an area, arena, where you have dominion. But it's how you behave in that family. Do you just claim your Christianity when you want to look good? Or something really bad happens and you say, oh God, I'm back. That's what most people do. We have to start walking in that so when, when the storm comes, we're not going to sway. Hey, we know who we are in Christ. We're going to stay there. And this is not a, it's not a gender deal. It's not an age, age issue. It's not a race issue. 
This is completely equal. When, when he says that all men were created equal, this is what he's talking about. Your salvation, when you're born again, you are created equal in Christ. What you have to do is give up your old family and walk in the new life. Next, we have to understand as we go through the scriptures, you see this in the New Testament, you go through the scriptures and you could pick these things out. And we're going to step into, I'm, 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 I'm trying to move as fast as I can. What is Jesus doing right now seated next to the Father? He's interceding. He's building you a mansion. He sees these things. So the, Christ himself is seated up there, which is a form of completion. He's completed everything that needs to be done for your life to be successful. You have to get under the light. You have to shift. Then there's another issue you have to do. You have to trust. See, we go from this fear to faith, but in this faith factor is a trust. You've got to learn to trust God. Well, I don't see it all happening. You know? Well, you know, you see Paul, the shipwreck, he goes, well, you know, hey, by the way, you guys are going to lose everything, but you get to live. How much? That's as valuable as it gets. And it boils down to your family. You know, you know, you know we, we got the folks from Korea. I t I, I've heard some horror stories during the, about the Korean War. And when I go over to Korea, I see these old men. I'm talking hardcore warriors. And you see in Korea these giant bridges, all this metal and everything. And these guys went through the war and then they reconstruct and rebuilt the country. And then you see the, the generation of the K-pop boys. You know, the K-pop boys. You know, these guys, these guys are prettier than the girls. <laughs> and the old man, I, I just, I just, I just want, I, I, you know, I want to grab one of these old guys and go out and just pound on some of these guys. Because all they want to do is look pretty. And that's what's going on with the church. We need that old school fortitude. Understand that Christ is up there. He's watching us too. Oh yeah, he is. He's keeping score. He's watching us. He's interceding for you. Don't fumble. Don't fumble. Stop that. Listen to what my spirit's saying. I'm in you. Hello. He's doing this on a continuous basis. So we, we have to understand what Jesus is doing. Number five, the fifth area. What can God do, do through us Using his word through our lips. You got a job. Your house is there. Your son's healed. The money's coming. Those things have to be a part of your trust issue too. If you say something and you don't believe it, it won't happen. All right. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes, sir. Uh, and I, I got, I, we had an issue this week at work where... I confronted somebody on a realistic basic and they said, well, nobody's ever talked to me like that before. This is a full grown man. Exactly. Exactly. So when, when, when there's something going on and you confront somebody and their emotions jump up before their spirit. If their emotions are more is stronger than their soul. We got some issues. We got some issues. And we were battling this. I was talking to uh, Bill last night. You know Bill, the old man, the Japanese guy? The professor? Yeah, you guys, you, you've seen him, whatever. Great man. And it's so funny, because I've heard him switch into this, I'm dealing with souls. Let me tell you what a soul is. It's a confused person because he's allowing his soul to manage his spirit. We are created spirit, mind, soul, emotion, body. And if your mind, your soul, your emotions are controlling your body, when the devil comes, you will get sick. Because you've opened the door for the devil to come in and rob, steal, and kill. Your spirit man is greater than... Your, your mind, your soul, your emotions, and is stronger than your body. It is. 
And then your spirit, rejuvenated, rebirthed with Christ, is strengthened and is quickened, so you're not going to have any issues in the mind. I believe we can pray over our minds so we don't have Alzheimer's. We can pray over these things where God gives us the right cures in herbs, not pharmacia, to keep our bodies healthy. Praise God. So what can God do through your lips? Well, we're going to have a Sunday service. We're speaking that through our lips. God's going to establish this. He's bringing in the ministers. He's taking care of us financially. We are, we are clarifying the goals that he's giving us. Praise God. So that proclamation is a pronunciation of God's plan for us. With, let me, this is what the Lord showed me with a proclamation is, is pronouncing God's plan established on not only the word of God, but a working model from the Bible. It's a reestablishing of something that's already been established. So the proclamation, nothing new is under the sun. We just have to understand when we proclaim it, it will work. It will work. It's not going to go away. It's not going to fall down. And there's vindication. There you go. The Lord just told me. Vindication is part of your proclamation. So let's go to Hebrews 13. Oh, I like this part. I'm, I'm going to try to speed it up. Hebrews 13, 5 through 6. Okay? Hebrews 13, 5 through 6. Oh, I messed up. Uh, let your character be free from the love of money and content that which will have for himself. He has said, I will never desert you nor I will, I will ever forsake you so that we confidently say, we boldly say, we proclaim this. The Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What shall a man do to me? That's a pretty strong proclamation. That's a strong proclamation. So if, if you've been ever been abused by a man, that's a pretty strong proclamation right there. And that goes for men. They've been abused by men. But it also has to do with things that are coming at, the, at us in the flesh and how we're going to break it down. So the bold confession of understanding what they can do, there's a problem. Most folks do not align themselves up with their spirit and the word of God so that when they get attacked, they fall down. There's three areas that we're going to deal with, and I'm going to wrap this up real quick, and we're going to go into this a little bit deeper as we go. The three areas are in Christ, okay, part of your confession, in whom that has to do with your positioning and the other one in him there's a difference understanding Christ the Messiah and after you're saved in him what are you doing we're going to break that down here real quick and so in 2 Corinthians 5 17 in Christ we're, we're going to run through this we appreciate this. I, I know there's a lot to cover, but we're going we're gonna to go over this uh, a few more times. And so I, I want to get this deep into your spirit, man. Um, 2 Corinthians 5.17. And it says, Therefore, if any man is in Christ, okay, are you in Christ? You're born again, you're in Christ. He is a new creature... New creation some places. All old things have been passed away and behold new things have come. You are different now than you were before you were born again. So why do you act that way? You got soul ties. You've been wounded. You, you're in unforgiveness. You don't understand the covenant. You don't have to walk in that. I was, I was, watching, I was watching somebody. I forget who it was. Oh it was my friend Christian Hasoy. How many people know who Christian Hasoy is? The skateboarder guy. 
How many people heard of Tony Hawk? Uh, I, need a, I need a younger generation. This guy was a world champion skateboarder, and he was in prison before he got arrested, just living the life he was in. He got arrested, got born again, and he went in prison. He had freedom. Because he found Christ as he went into prison. Is that amazing? And you hear those kind of stories over and over and over. So we need to be in Christ in whom, let's go to uh, Ephesians. And Paul talks about in whom a lot. Ephesians 1, verse one, uh, 7 and 8. In him, right there, we have redemption through blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, and according to the riches of his grace, we have, he has which he, ha he lavished upon us in all wisdom, insight. He's made known to us the mystery of his will according to his kind intention, which he's purpose in him. Whatever's happened to you, you got Christ. He's in you. You're in him. He has a plan for you. You should share that plan sometimes, guys. I can't, I can't go out and soul win. Brett goes out. We need to be soul winning. We need to be praying for our families. They, their eyes open up. We got all the Ephesian prayers we can be praying. You see that in uh, the same in whom in, in uh, Colossians 1, chapter 1, 12 through 14. In whom? He starts that off in whom when he's talking to, in the epistles to many other places because he wants to have that reference point with each person. Paul just doesn't preach one thing to one city. He takes that same concept and he repeats himself over and over to make sure that they have a clear picture of their salvation. We also see that in uh, 1 Corinthians 16, uh, chapter 6, 19 through 20. So in him, in, uh, in, him, in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 20, 2 Corinthians 5, 20, we see this manifest. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ as through God we, are entreating, we were entreating through us. We beg you on, the, on behalf of Christ to reconcile to God. There are people that are dysfunctional trying to be Christians. He said, he made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf that we might become the righteousness of God. There's a point where you understand that God, whatever he paid for your mess, cleaned it up 100%, you need to give it up and start walking in a clean manner. Well, that's pretty judging. No, you judge yourself. You clean up your own yard. I can't do it for you. But if you walk by me and you stink, I can smell it. Right? Is that, is that a Texas preaching? So that righteousness starts appearing and we have to understand what righteousness has to do with confession, covenant, and proclamation. You cannot proclaim things when you're not in a righteous state. If you're saying, I'm a Christian, well, uh, uh, one saved, always saved. Hey, you know what? You may be saved, but you're going to miss the first bus. I'm serious. You're in sin. These things are happening. And I believe there's a stability here that we're, we're pro proclaiming these things over this ministry. I've talked to Greg about, you know, he has a men's ministry. And we, we've, there's a lot of issues we deal with. And people don't want to talk about it. And when somebody comes up to me and they tell me they're, they're hooked on this and they're doing that and they're sleeping around, nah, you know what, that's wrong. And when the devil comes with a plague and, you, and you're uh, unrepented, he's going to find that loophole. And there are going to be people dying on the spot. You're going to go, why would he die? He's so healthy. He's, he's righteous. He's clean cut. Well, he's, he's the, the man. That's going to be an issue. And so this is part of what we'll be t talking about tomorrow. Let's go to Romans 319 through 26. We're talking about a confession of righteousness, which is something we have to line up in our bodies. We have to line up in our spirit. 
and I was talk I was talking to Bill last night. And I said, you know what? Nothing personal. I don't believe it's, you know, there's there's single people, and the devil uses it against you after a certain age where it's it's just hard on your body. And we pray for helpmates and spouses for people. Praise God. God fearing folk, not just, you know, uh, somebody out there. Let's go to uh, now we know verse 19. Now we know whatever the law says, it's to speak to those who are under the law. That every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. The law was to show us the sin. When we use the word Torah, that's true. It's instruction. But also there's a flip side of the Torah where it reveals you're unclean. You're not right with God. So we, I, don't, I, I try not to use the word law as most people use in the Old Testament that the Old Testament is the law. No. Torah is instruction. Within Torah, you will see where you're stumbling. Praise God. So as we, we go down here, but the works of the law, uh, the, because by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in, its, for, in, in his sight, for through the law comes the knowledge of sin. We have to have the understanding of Torah, because if, if your father tells you, hey, you're stumbling, you need to start accepting it. And we have a fatherless society when you tell somebody something, they're like they're offended all the time. That's not it. We have to keep the focus of the body of Christ. This is where we're at. It was end time ministry. We've got to keep that focus. But we're going to continue understanding that, you know, through uh, 19 through 26, I'm going to glance through this. There's a, even the righteousness of God through the faith in Jesus Christ for all those believe there is no distinction. If you're in sin, you're in sin. You got to get out of it. Yeah. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Yes, you got saved, but you're still in sin. You got to get yourself cleaned up. Being justified, justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption of which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness because in forbearance of God, he passed over the sins previously committed. Yes, you got saved. Keep yourself cleaned up. Wow, this is heavy duty stuff. For the demonstration I saw, I say of his righteousness at the present time that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Some, it says just and justifier. Yours may say righteous and righteousness. Same words. I like them both. They have different actions but same purpose. Different disposition but same outcome. There has to be a self-reflection of knowing, okay, you know what, I got this kind of this gut feeling something's not right with me. You need to examine yourself. And he gives you the Bible. He gives you the word. He gives you prayer and discernment through the spirit. I, I'm not here to clean up your yard. There's not, there's not a lot of me that's out there to help you. And this is what we're talking about. If everything hits the fan, you can't go to the hospital because everybody else will be running to the hospital. How are you going to take care of yourself? If they shut down the churches and they start going after the pastors, were well, you guys going to come visit me in jail? <laughs> Seriously. What are they going to do? You have to be built up by yourself so you can maintain your body and your, 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 your communion with God. Uh, Romans 5, 14 through 17. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses... Think about that. It, until the law, they, there was no, nobody, until they got the law, they did not understand what to do to clean themselves up. You see that? Death reigned. So the releasing of the word through Moses gave us some hope. Basically, he gave you a rake to clean your own yard. <laughs> Can you imagine just having to go out there and pick up the leaves one by one? No, he gave you a rake to clean it up th through understanding of how we can contain some of this mess. Verse 14. 
Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam until Moses, even over those who had not sinned in the likeness of the uh, offense of Adam, who was a type of him who was to come. Maybe, maybe not Enoch, but there was a, some righteous people that died. But the free gift is not like the transgression, for it is by the transgression of one many died. Much more did the grace of God and the gift by the, the grace of one of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound to many. Verse 16, and the gift is not like that of which came through one who sinned. For on the one hand, the judgment arose from the transgression resulting in condemnation. But on the other hand, the free gift arose from many transgression resulting in justification. For it is by the transgression of one, Adam, death reigned through the one who, the one much more those who received the abundance of the grace. And the gift of righteousness will reign in the life through one Jesus Christ. Let me say this. Adam's sin, that pollution of sin, infected you. You couldn't do anything about it. Christ came, inoculated you, gave you the vaccine. He fixed you, but you have to go through the rehabilitation process yourself. You have to pronounce it. You got to claim it. You got to walk in it. You got to exercise the word. See what I'm saying? You're not going to just get born again and you're snap, you're clean. Wow, I just took all the fun out of playing church. <laughs> what are these people going to do? But then we end up with a confession of righteousness. Not because we're saying we're self-righteous, but we're in right standing with God. We've gotten all that garbage out. We said, your, your sacrifice was all I needed to step out of that sin nature and take on my new nature in Christ by your word, by your spirit, by your son, by the revelation, the mystery of what my purpose is on this earth to expand the kingdom. Praise God. What has the church been doing for 2,000 years? We have to get to this level where, God, we're going to go out there and battle. I mean, G Jesus surrendered at the cross, took on all this iniquity, and we don't want to even try. Oh, we're offended. No, 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 not on my watch. I'm serious. And... And you know what? I will battle like this by myself. We're all battle like this with the army. And we're calling people to arms right now in the spirit. And you've got to fight for your kids. Because we had it in our generation. And we've lost it. We remember when we were kids. You know, the Baptist kidnapped me when I was seven years old. The Mormons didn't want me. I'm sorry, the Baptists take anybody. And I remember they called, they, they did an altar call. They say, you go up there to the altar and you receive Jesus, you get a pencil. Man, I went up there, I wept. I mean, the Spirit of God hit me, I wept. Plus, I got a pencil. But, <laughs> but there, there, was, there was a connection there. And I had, I, I'm telling you, I went up there and I had stuff coming out of my face. And I, the Spirit of God hit me. And so I know, I know I have a calling in certain areas. You do too. And this is where we go back to the beginning where we we're teaching. What is your covenant? Where did you start? When do you really believe that this covenant is a true covenant and this is what God wants you to do right now? When those idiots put a bomb on and they think they're going to go get 70 virgins, hey, they think, they, you seen the guy that puts the brick on? They, they go blow themselves up. We can't even get people to come to church on Fridays and Saturdays and Sundays. <laughs> Seriously. I mean, I made Alfredo, guys. This is the time. And we got a lot of ministers out here. I'm telling you, if I know who you are. There's a lot of ministers out here. And if you can't put in the extra time, you can't work as a team, we're in trouble. 
If you're the leader of your family, you need to take authority. If you're praying and interceding, you need to take authority. But your mindset has to have a long-term perspective that God is going to be victorious and you will succeed. And even if it takes you out, you're going to be there. Father, we just prayed you for your spirit. We thank you for the clarity of this house. We thank you for the victories that are coming. We thank you that you will supply all of our needs in Christ Jesus. We praise you, Father, that your spirit will touch and be activated. We ask for the baptism of the Holy Spirit over all the folks that need it, that are here. We ask for those words to be spoken out in faith, not in fear. We ask for needs to be met tonight, but we also ask, Father, that you encourage us individually as we pray to stand up in battle in the mighty name of Yeshua.